Hello and welcome to another episode of What's Up Prof. Hi Martin. Good day Walter. Hi. Are you doing well? Yes, I'm doing well today, thank you. Ah, we are here again and we are, we've had an episode on current events again. And it's time to... We, we were talking about the preparing in a time of war and rumors of wars and looking forward to all of these calamities that might hit us. The signs of the time. Yes. But how do we prepare? It's an important thing. Yes. So and how do you make a decision as to what banner you want to stand under? Yeah. And there's requirements in the Bible that we have to adhere to. But before we do that, let's open with a word of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you for all the blessings that you bestow upon us, and thank you for giving us the opportunity to still do these discussions. We ask that you enlighten our minds, also help through the discussion, and that everybody can get a message that you want to bring out of this. In Jesus' name, Amen. Amen. Martin, there are so many people who want to take an independent stand. Mm. It's like uh, somebody saying, I'm going to sit on the fence. Yeah, it's, it's the same actually. Yeah. It's the same, isn't it? Or I'm not going to be part of any movement because uh, I just want to belong to Christ. Yeah. Now, didn't Jesus say in the time of Jesus, salvation is from the Jews? Yes. So there was a specific path that he had identified. That doesn't mean that only Jews were saved. No. There were Naamans that were saved. Mm -hmm. There were widows from other regions that were saved. That's there right. were you know, many uh, that embraced truth. But it still was his purpose to have a group yeah. That was the harbor of truth. Yep. And they perverted the truth. Yes. But if you pervert something, but you still have it, that means that people must discern between what is the original truth and what is a perverted truth. Yeah. So if I give you a parcel of truth and you pervert it, you still have the truth. Yes. You've just perverted it. It's like the Pharisees. When they were speaking, Jesus said, do as they say, not as they do. Yes. So we're going to talk about the final gathering and the sons and heirs. And uh, it's, a, it's a topic that gets many people hot under the collar. <laughs> I think we are quite renowned for... Discussing things that get people hot under the cover. Yes, cover. yes, yes. Let's, let's continue to do that. <laughs> Galatians 3. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. You know, if you, if you look at the depth of the Old Testament, it's absolutely amazing, right? How much depth there is in it. And uh, the little details, even when it comes to judgments mm. upon people mm. or what happened in the past, how it relates to the plan of salvation. But you see, that's, we've mentioned it many times before. You don't just read the Old Testament as a historical book. Once you get all the things that pertain unto today as well, and all the extra meanings that the stories Correct. have. It's it was amazing. the gospel in type. Yeah. Now, he redeemed us from the curse of the law. Mm. It doesn't say he redeemed us from the law. Oh, if people will only read that like it stands. Yes, so the, the law condemned us to death. Mm -hmm. And that curse, Christ took upon himself. Because it reads there, cursed is everyone that hangs on a tree. Uh, Colossians 2 verse 14, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to the cross. This verse is so often attributed to the law when it is actually the ceremonial law. Yeah. Because that was the handwriting of ordinances. 
and the handwriting of ordinances is what Moses wrote and it was placed beside the ark. Yeah. And it pointed to the death of Christ. It was the sacrificial system with all its types and ceremonies. And by one sacrifice he has forever made perfect. Therefore nailing the ceremonial law to the cross. Yeah, or for that matter, a tree. But he didn't nail the law, no. the Ten Commandments, to the cross. Because he says the law is holy, just, and good. In another place it says the law is perfect, yeah. converting the soul. Now, why would you want to abrogate something that is perfect? Yeah. It's stupidity. Yeah. And if God were to abrogate his law, the basis of his government, then he might as well abrogate himself. Correct. Because then he has no more authority. He has nothing more to say. How can he expect obedience if there is nothing to obey? <laughs> <laughs> if you it. just work it through logically, how can you then say the law is gone? The law stands forever and ever, says the Bible. Deuteronomy 21, verse 23. His body shall not remain all night upon the tree, but thou shalt in any wise bury him that day, for he that is hanged is accursed of God, that thy land be not defiled, which the Lord thy God giveth thee for an inheritance. What a marvelous mm -hmm. instruction. And a prophecy. Yes, it's a prophecy. Was Jesus removed that very day? Yes. Was he cursed of God? Yes. He took the curse that fell upon us, upon himself. Yeah, because of the transgression of the law. He, by his stripes we are healed. Yeah. Now, if he could have done away with the law, then there would have been no transgression, because there would be no law to transgress. Then he would not have to have died. If people would logically think this through, they would understand the plan of salvation better. Mm. It is because the law is immutable that he hung on that tree. Yeah. Otherwise, you could have just come and preached, don't worry, the, I have come, the law is taken away. Was the devil thrown out of heaven? Yes. Were Adam and Eve thrown out of the Garden of Eden? Yes. Were there conditions attached to their return? Yes. Okay. The one they were thrown out because of trans transgression and obedience would bring them back. All right. But only through faith in the Redeemer, the promised one. The one that was not at fault. Yes. The one who said that he will put enmity between the seed of the devil and the seed of the woman, the church. Yeah. Galatians 3 verse 29. And if ye be Christ, then ye are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Mm. So who are the heirs according to the promise? They that are Abraham's seed and therefore Christ's. So they're there that obey the law. So if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's seed. Yeah. Okay. So let's have a look at this little word heirs mm. and have just, do a little bit of a contemplation as to what it means. Romans 8 verse 12. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh to live after the flesh. For if you live after the flesh, you shall die. Mm. In other words, if you sin, the wages of sin are death. That's it. But if through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, you shall live. In other words, if you, through the power of the Holy Spirit, mm -hmm. correct your life, you will live. Yeah. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. Now, in another place it says, it's in Acts chapter 5, that you receive the Holy Spirit when you obey God. That's it. I think we actually did... a. Uh, Oh, like, um, what's a prof on it? Yes. Who are the sons of God? All right. So you receive this leading of the Holy Spirit when you repent, realize that you are a transgressor of mm -hmm. God's law, ask God to clean up your act, and then you become a son of God. Yeah. 
For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. In other words, you are reconciled with God. The Spirit itself bearing witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs. Mm. Heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. If so be that we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. So Martin, can you remove Christ out of this equation? No, not at all. He is the one that helps you to become a son of God and heir. And he's the one that enables yeah. you. He's the one who makes it possible again. He's the perfect obedient one. Mm -hmm. I have come to do thy will, O oh my God. Right? Yeah. Thy law is within my heart. So this is the character of Christ. So he, the sinless one, paid the price for my transgression and through his wounds I can be healed. Mm. But I have to appropriate them by faith. Yeah. Okay. And if I do that, I become an heir together with Christ. All right. What was that first uh, section that we read? The law. Yes. Was a curse. Yes. So you do away with the law? No, you no. pay the price. Yeah. God paid the price for you. Mm -hmm. And the law could not be abrogated. Can you divorce the law from the plan of salvation? No. Because then you divorce Christ from the plan of salvation. If there is no law, there's no transgression. If there's no transgression, there's no need of, of a redeemer. Mm. No need. No. So you cannot divorce the law from the plan of salvation. And you cannot divorce Christ, the sinless one, from the plan of salvation. No. They go together and they will remain together for all eternity. That's it. Romans 4, verse 14. And if they which are of the law be heirs, faith is made void. And the promise made of none effect. That's a pretty powerful statement. So if you say, I am saved because I keep the law, mm. then you have disqualified yourself from heaven. Yeah. Now that obviously means then, according to some, that you must not keep the law. <laughs> Unfortunately, <laughs> they go that route, yes. Then they go that route because they divorce <laughs> the union between Christ and obedience, right? That's true because they want... You see, you've got the works on the one side and then... The legalists on the other side. All right, so let's just rephrase this verse over here and say that if you are a legalist and think you can be saved through the, by the law, then the promise by faith is made of non-effect because faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Mm. Whereas if you keep the law, everybody can see that you are keeping the law. Yeah. Or if you pretend to keep the law, some may see the pretense as keeping the law. Yes, but somewhere down the line, that will fail. That will fail. You cannot keep up. If it's not true repentance, the reason, and true conviction, the reason why you're keeping the law, it, it won't keep up. No, it won't. And if you be Christ's, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. That is a, such a powerful verse. So the if there is a very important mm. little word. It's a very small little word. <laughs> but remove it and the whole, the whole story falls apart, right? Yeah. So what is the prerequisite? You have to be Christ's in order to be Abraham's seed. You know, you people see, would like to turn that round and say, but Christ is Abraham's seed. Yes, but before Abraham was, I am. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so they, they, have, they, can't, they can't get their way. But you see, also now that you mentioned that word if, it's a small word, um, it's interesting that in the King James, it, there's always either the if or should. Yes. But the other translations sometimes go and change it. For instance, John 3 verse 16, where... Um, God so 
loved the world that he sent his only begotten son. And then the King James says that everyone that believeth in him should. It doesn't say shall. Yes. The other one says shall. So this if is in the same portion. There's, an, there's a requirement. Yes. It's not just a given. Yes. There is a condition. The condition. All right. Hebrews 6 verse 17, we're in God, willing more abundantly to show unto the heirs of promise the immutability of his counsel, confirming it by an oath. So this promise to be an heir is an immutable, immutable subject. So God promises it, so it is established by an oath. It is promised. It is not movable. You can't move it, right? Hebrews 11 verse 9, By faith he sojourned in the land of promise, as in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs, with him of the same promise. Mm. Why were Isaac and Jacob heirs? Because they were his literal seed, but so was, so was Ishmael. Oh, yeah. No. Nope. Why were they heirs of the promise? By their faith. Because they believed and yeah. it was accredited to them for righteousness. And uh, if you take Jacob, how he wrestled with God and how he said, I will not let you go lest you bless me. That is the way that you become heirs. So he had repentance for his transgression mm -hmm. and he embraced the one he was wrestling with, who was Christ, and he would not let him go. Yeah. So he became an heir of the promise. That's it. But there were sojourners and never received anything on this earth. No, not on the earth. <laughs> no. But the Fortunately the not, because then we would be with, without inheritance. <laughs> 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 so this promise extends to eternal life, yeah. right? Yeah. That's, that's the real promise. Is with Christ. I mean, that is such a privilege. Yes. All right, so let's have a little bit of a look at this book of Galatians. It's such a fascinating story, and there's so many confusions. What is he talking about? Is he talking about the law mm -hmm. of Ten Commandments? Is he talking about the ceremonial law? Where are we in this divide? What if he's talking about both? It can be both. Okay. And its context is a, has a lot to play there. Yes. But also, when you mentioned earlier that the ordinances and the writings of Moses was next to the ark and the moral law inside of the ark, when Jesus nailed it to the cross, it does not mean that it was not worth anything. Oh no, it was the plan of salvation in type. So it, he didn't destroy it, he just fulfilled it. Correct. So in Christ, everything still exists. He is the anti-typical sacrifice. So here's a quote from the Acts of the Apostles. While tarrying at Corinth, Paul had cause for serious apprehension concerning some of the churches already established. Through the influence of false teachers who had arisen amongst the believers in Jerusalem, division, heresy, and sensualism. It's interesting that that one always comes in as well, right? We're rapidly gaining ground amongst the believers in Galatia. These false teachers were mingling Jewish traditions with the truths of the gospel. Ignoring the decisions of the general council at Jerusalem, they urged upon the Gentile converts the observance of the ceremonial law. The situation was critical. The evils that had been introduced threatened speedily to destroy the Galatian churches. Now, Martin, mingling Jewish traditions with the truth of the gospel, that's history. Mm -hmm. Are the modern-day people not mingling human traditions with the truth of the gospel? Exactly the same. We've got to repeat. Oh, well, I think it's never changed. It's just on a different level, right? Mm -hmm. But it's the same thing. Paul was cut to the heart, and his soul was stirred by this open apostasy on the part of those 
to whom he had faithfully taught the principles of the gospel. He immediately wrote to the deluded believers exposing the false theories that they had accepted and with great severity rebuking those who were departing from the faith. Uh, that brings to mind again the modern situation. Mm -hmm. If you say something, then you are without love. That's what they say. Don't judge me. Don't judge me. But with great severity, he rebuked those that were departing from the faith. Why? Because he didn't care or because he was a hard taskmaster or because he cared? Because he cared. And that brings me also to, back to people accuse us of not taking on the apostasy in our own ranks. But we take on the transgression. We don't single out the transgressor. No. If the shoe fits, then wear it. It's, so we are very vehemently opposed to any apostasy. Correct. But we are not in the game of pointing out the individual. Individuals. And you unless, can see unless it is a public sin. Uh, that's it. That can be publicly rebuked. For sure. But you can see the same was done by Paul to the Galatians. Yes. It was with severity that he was rebuking them. But he didn't single out certain people. No, there's no mention here of any of that. So after saluting the Galatians in the words, grace to you and peace from God the Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ, he addresses to them these words of sharp reproof. I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. Paul's teaching had been in harmony with the scriptures and the Holy Spirit had witnessed to his labors. Therefore, he warned his brethren not to listen to anything that contradicted the truths he had taught them. And yet, they would, in favor of their pet theories, rather get rid of Paul. Don't they want to do it still today? Today. There are whole movements, particularly in our country, that say you cannot include the writings of Paul yeah. because it contradicts their favorite dogmas mm -hmm. of exclusiveness. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the apostle bade the Galatian believers consider carefully their first experience in the Christian church. Oh, foolish Galatians, he explained, who has bewitched you that you should not obey the truth before whose eyes Jesus Christ has been evidently set forth, crucified amongst you. This only would I learn of you. Received ye the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Are you so foolish, having begun in the Spirit? Are you now made perfect by the flesh? Have you suffered so many things in vain, if it be yet in vain? He, therefore, that ministereth to you the Spirit and worketh miracles amongst you, does he it by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Now, Martin, God looked at you and saw your beautiful obedience, mm. and that is why he called you into the ministry, right? <laughs> <laughs> Definitely not. <laughs> Definitely not, right? <laughs> there we were in the world. Doing our thing. Totally the opposite of what he actually expects from you. You were a rave DJ <laughs> in the middle of the night. <laughs> and when you in the middle of the night is quite true. Yes, and when you got too exhausted, your wife took over. <laughs> <laughs> she, and me, I was an atheist, <laughs> cursing God, believing in evolution. So I definitely was not redeemed by the works of the law. No. And neither were you, right? And so neither is anyone else no. on this planet, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So if you think that you can be redeemed by the works of the law, then think again. That's it. There's only faith in Jesus Christ that changes it. 1 Corinthians 12, 3. Wherefore I gave you to understand that no man speaking by the Spirit of God calls Jesus a curse. And that no man can say that Jesus is the Lord, but by the Holy Ghost. So Martin, if you 
cannot say that Jesus is Lord, mm. then you don't have the Holy Spirit. Right? Now, many people say Jesus is Lord, but they don't keep the law. Yeah. Then, then they also can't have the Holy Spirit because Acts chapter 5 says the Holy Spirit is given to them that obey him. Yeah. So, did you have the Holy Spirit? No. Did I have the Holy Spirit? When he we was always called? there knocking. Yes, but I didn't have him. You he wasn't the gift yet. Mm, you didn't accept him. He was a pricking instrument. Yeah. Yeah. And who was kicking against the pricks? You mm -hmm. and I and Paul. Yeah. Until he got a whack. Mm -hmm. Did you get a whack? Yes. <laughs> I also got a whack. <laughs> got a few whacks. <laughs> okay. So he's Lord. He's Kyrios. Mm. What does that mean? Well, Thayer defines it, he to whom a person or thing belongs about which he has power of deciding, master, lord, the possessor and disposer of a thing, the owner, one who has control of the person, the master. So it's the sovereign, the prince, the chief, the emperor. It's a title of honor, expressive of respect and reverence with which servants greet their master. This title is given to God, the Messiah. It's part of speech. It's a noun. It's masculine. It's not transgender. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't have an identity crisis. Yeah. No, it doesn't identify as a cat or anything else. It's what it is. So, Martin, here is the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the owner. He's the creator. He's the owner by creation. He's the owner by redemption. He's he God. has repurchased you. And he's God. And he's the Messiah. Mm. So if I say he is Lord mm. and he is the master, then do I have to obey him? Yes. Okay. Thus Paul arraigned the believers in Galatia before the tribunal of their own conscience and sought to arrest them in their course, relying on the power of God to save and refusing to recognize the doctrines of the apostate teachers the apostle endeavored to lead the converts to see that they had been grossly deceived, but that by returning to their former faith in the gospel, they might yet defeat the purpose of Satan. He took his position firmly on the side of truth and righteousness, and his supreme faith and confidence in the message he bore helped many whose faith had failed to return to their allegiance to the Savior. How different from Paul's manner of writing to the Corinthian church was the course he pursued towards the Galatians. The former he rebuked with caution and tenderness, the latter with words of unsparing reproof. The Corinthians had been overcome by temptation. So it is necessary sometimes to rebuke false mm -hmm. gospels. Mm -hmm. Did it happen in the Reformation? Oh, for sure. I mean, what was the Martin Luther's thesis all about? Correct. And here he was addressing the traditions of men, mm. right? Indulgences yeah. were purely a tradition of men in order to pay for a, a structure that were, they were erecting with marvelous paintings on ceilings that will one day come to naught. Mm -hmm. And that will bring you... Salvation. Salvation. Yes. What nonsense. Mm. And he rightly rebuked it. And he placed a lot of emphasis on righteousness by faith. Rightly so. Yeah. Does that make righteousness by faith null and void? No. No. But unfortunately, people then veered to the other side and placed more emphasis on that than on obedience. Sounds like the Galatians. It's just like the Galatians. And so we, we have the same situation today packaged in a different form. Yeah, and different, let's say, people, churches like the Corinthians and the Galatians do things differently, but both of it's in apostasy. Yes. So deceived by the ingenious sophistry of teachers who presented errors under the guise of truth, 
they had become confused and bewildered. To teach them to distinguish the false from the true called for caution and patience. Harshness or injudicious haste on Paul's part would have destroyed his influence over many of those whom he longed to help. In the Galatian churches, open, unmasked error was supplanting the gospel message. Christ, the true foundation of the faith, was virtually renounced for the obsolete ceremonies of Judaism. If you take Catholicism today, mm -hmm. don't they absolutely negate salvation in Christ? Completely. There's no, no salvation in Christ. Everything is through the sacraments, through ceremonies, and through decrees. Yeah. Nothing, nothing has to do with Christ. He's not even in the atonement. The apostles saw that if the believers in Galatia were saved from the dangerous influence which threatened them, the most decisive measures must be taken, the sharpest warnings given. So it's important, Martin, that an important lesson for every minister of Christ to learn is that of adapting his labors to the condition of those whom he seeks to benefit. Mm -hmm. We have a whole world, Martin, that is steeped in tradition. And we have a whole world of Protestantism that sees no error any longer in Catholicism. No. They're yeah. joining hands. Now, how does that make any sense? But even in, the, in our own church, it's also important to, to adhere to this. There's a lot of apostasy. It's, you have to, as a minister, also know how to deal with each situation. Yes, and as a member, you must know how to deal with those in high positions mm. that think that uh, unity with those outside of the realms of obedience to all of God's mm. commandments seems to be the way forward. Yeah. But actually, that should be rebuked in the same way that Paul rebuked the Galatians. That's it. So tenderness, patience, decision, and firmness are alike needful. But these are to be exercised with proper discrimination. To deal wisely with different classes of minds under various circumstances and conditions is a work requiring wisdom and judgment enlightened and sanctified by the Spirit of God. You know, I think of Solomon who prayed for wisdom. Mm. But he also prayed for a tender heart. Makes sense, and yeah. uh, he got his riches as well. Pity that he later uh, apostatized anyway. In his letter to the Galatian believers, Paul briefly reviewed the leading incidents connecting with his own conversion and early Christian experience. By this means, he's thought to show that it was through a special manifestation of divine power that he had been led to see and grasp the great truths of the gospel. It was through instruction received from God himself that Paul was led to warn and admonish the Galatians in so solemn and positive a manner. He wrote not in hesitancy and doubt, but with assurance of settled conviction and absolute knowledge. He clearly outlined the difference between being taught by man and receiving instructions direct from Christ. Now, he wrote all those things down, mm. and we can read them. Yeah. And are they being confused? Oh, completely. Romans, the book of Romans, and Galatians for that matter. Didn't Peter say, <laughs> Paul writes some things hard to understand? Mm. But in actual fact, when you start unraveling it, it's not hard to understand. It's the relationship between law and grace. That's it. You just put that in context. And if you start reading it with, with knowing that, yes. it, it's much So if you easier. take Romans, are you saved by keeping the law? No, no. Definitely not. You are not saved by keeping the law. Do you make void the law thereby? No. God forbid <laughs> you establish the law. Now, you know... To many minds, that must be a yeah. cognitive dissonance, a dichotomy of thinking. Yeah. How can you establish something that you can't use for <laughs> salvation? You see, if you understand the context, yes, 
then it makes sense. But if you just want to, if your if you feet, elevate one an iota yeah. over the other, ah, so you become confused. That's it. So if you put the other before where it should be, if you want to get rid of the law, you can read Romans as getting rid of it. Yes. But if you want to know how to get saved, then you read that that. The law is established, but not by, like you've mentioned, keeping it because you want to be saved. Yes, but still, you have to keep it. You have to keep because it. Because nobody will be saved by keeping mm. the law, but nobody will be saved by neglecting the law. Exactly. Let me just make it clear, because people have a tendency to misunderstand how I put things. Because sometimes the language bar barrier gets in the way. Yes. So what I mean is, you keep the law... Because you're saved. Because you want to keep it. Yes. You don't keep it to be saved. Who enables you to want to keep it? Jesus. Because your flesh was against keeping oh, for it. For sure. Eh? I was sitting in a, in a restaurant the other day. I was waiting for a takeaway. Mm. And the television was blaring there on the screen. And... It was hard not to look at it because it was right in front of you. And it had uh, music videos on it. But they were so licentious. Yeah. And you think to yourself, this is what the world craves. This is what it's like. This is what happens in the nightclubs, right? Mm -hmm. this, is, this is the portrayal of what happens. And you can see there how the flesh wars against the law. Yeah. And you have to, you have to thank God that th that doesn't have power. That's true. Because how many people are ruined because it has power over them? But that is the norm and the standard of the world. The flesh wars against righteousness. And righteousness wars against the flesh. So, all very interesting. So he urged the Galatians to leave the false guides by whom they had been misled and to return to the faith that had been accompanied by unmistakable evidence of divine approval. The men who had attempted to lead them from their belief in the gospel were hypocrites, unholy in heart and corrupt in life. Martin, if you say that to some of the modern teachers out there, they would be highly offended. <laughs> yes. Their religion was made up of a round of ceremonies through the performance of which they expected to gain the favor of God. They had no desire for a gospel that called for obedience to the word, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God, quoting John 3 verse 3. They felt that the religion based on such a doctrine required too great a sacrifice, and they clung to their errors, deceiving themselves and others. To substitute external forms of religion for holiness of heart and life is still as pleasing to the unrenewed nature as it was in the days of these Jewish teachers. Today, as then, they are false spiritual guides to whose doctrines many listen eagerly. I sit and I watch them speaking to these mega churches mm. and teaching a gospel of prosperity without obedience to any of God's requirements. Yeah. Isn't that pathetic? No, it's, it's sad, actually. Because, and, and it's the majority. This yeah. is how it, if you, the minority... Well, Jesus said that the road is narrow yes. and filled with all sorts of obstacles. obstacles. So it is Satan's studied effort to divert minds from the hope of salvation through faith in Christ and obedience to the law of God. In every age, the arch enemy adapts his temptations to the prejudices or inclinations of those who he is seeking to deceive. In apostolic times, he led the Jews to exalt the ceremonial law and reject Christ. At the present time, he induces many professing Christians under pretense of honoring Christ to cast contempt on the moral law and to teach that its precepts may be transgressed with impunity. 
It is the duty of every servant of God to withstand firmly and decided these perverters of the faith and by the word of truth fearlessly to expose their errors. Now, Martin, some of them will expound on the virtues of the law, mm -hmm. but they neglect the fourth commandment. Yeah. Verily my Sabbath you shall keep, for it is a sign between me and you forever. Right? Yeah. That I am the Lord that sanctifies you. They just brush it aside and try to find scriptural yeah. proof for their position when there is none. Yeah. So in his effort to regain confidence of his brethren in Galatia, Paul ably vindicated his position as an apostle of Christ. He declared himself to be an apostle, not of men, neither by man, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father, who raised him from the dead. One receives a calling from God. That's it. And you either obey it or you don't. It's like when you, the person called you and said that she received um, information from God that you should finish her late husband's book. Yes. And she continued on and on, and then you said to her, But I haven't received such an instruction yet. <laughs> <laughs> so not from men, but from the highest authority in heaven had he received his commission. And his position had been acknowledged by a general council at Jerusalem with the decisions of which Paul had complied in all his labors amongst the Gentiles. It was not to exalt self, but to magnify the grace of God that Paul thus presented to those who were denying his apostleship proof that he was not a whit behind the very chiefest of the apostles, quoting 2 Corinthians. Those who sought to belittle his calling and his work were fighting against Christ whose grace and power were manifested through Paul. The apostle was forced by the opposition of his enemies to take a decided stand in maintaining his position and authority. Paul pleaded with those who had once known in their lives the power of God to return to their first love of the gospel truth. Is that our commission too? That's it. We were talking about preparing for all these things that's coming upon us. Mm -hmm. And so can we expect that these things that happened in Galatia and in Corinth is going to happen? Will we expect opposition from teachers that place traditions above? It? Can it happen in our own rank? Oh, it's, I, it cannot. It is. All right. So if it can be possible to support legislation against freedom of conscience, then surely when they make laws negating the commandments of God, based on their traditional concepts of righteousness, many might take their stand on mm -hmm. that side. Mm -hmm. but then you have to have the same admonition that Paul had. Yeah. So with unswervable arguments, he set before them their privilege of becoming free men and women in Christ, mm. through whose atoning grace all who make full surrender are clothed with the robe of his righteousness. This is the bottom line. You have to embrace the righteousness of Christ because your righteousness is just not going to cut it. Done. Finished. So now people say righteousness by faith negates the law. No, it elevates the law. Yes. Because, because the very word righteousness means doing what is right. That's it. And if you want to be an heir, just as Paul said to the Galatians, you have to obey the law because that's the only way to obey Christ. Did Christ say, I have kept the commandments? Yes, I have right? kept. I've kept them. So if he kept them, how did he keep them? Uh, half or perfectly? Perfectly. He kept them perfectly. Can I, do I keep them perfectly? No. No. So whose righteousness do I need? Christ's. His. So he must be working in me in order for me to keep the law perfectly. That's it. So I must work in my sphere and he must work in his sphere. And that can only be done through faith. Only through faith. So he took the position that every soul who would be saved must have a genuine personal experience in the things of God. I cannot be saved in a group. No. That doesn't mean I don't belong to a group. No. The, <laughs> the group is the... 
harborer the, yes of, of the truth and you have to be part of it but you are saved on your individual choice correct the apostles earnest words of entreaty were not fruitless the holy spirit wrought with mighty power and many whose feet had wandered into strange paths returned to their former faith in the gospel. Henceforth, they were steadfast in the liberty wherewith Christ had made them free. Free from what? Free from the condemnation of the law. Correct. And free from the bondage of sin. That's it. In other words, you were brought back, back into harmony. Go and sin no more. Henceforth, they were steadfast in the liberty which Christ had made them free. In their lives were revealed the fruits of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. So, Martin, do we have to ask ourselves, do we have love for those who do not necessarily, by the standards that we have, deserve love? We have to. Did Jesus have love oh, for yeah. those that didn't deserve it? Yes. Okay, joy. Is this worldly joy or is this joy of being saved? What is the, the joy of Christ? Isn't the joy of Christ seeing sinners saved? Yeah. Are you happy when you see a sinner saved? Oh, for sure. Okay, peace. Even in the midst of a storm? It's not the peace and safety that the nations are crying for. And I'm so glad that you've learned long suffering, <laughs> right, Martin? <laughs> I'm working on that one. <laughs> You're working on that one. Gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Mm. Temperance is also one of those easy ones. Yes. So the name of God was glorified and many were added to the number of believers through that region. So is it easy? No. And I was mentioning earlier that I'm working on that, but that's the wrong wording. Jesus, I must allow Jesus to help me work on that. You are quite right. So let's go back to Galatians. Now I say that the heir, that's the one who inherits the promise, right? As long as he is a child, differeth nothing from a servant, though he be Lord of all. Wow. Right? But he's under tutors and governors until the time appointed of the father. When I was very small, I think I was about nine or ten, we had a, a boarder living in the house. We'd taken, my parents had taken in a person that had come from overseas and took them under his wings. And he very soon started to think that it was his duty to govern me. <laughs> I was about ten. And he laid down the rules. And of course, I gladly accepted them, right? <laughs> of course. <laughs> no, I rebelled against them with every power of my being, calling him a cuss name with the word border afterwards. You're just a mm -mm border. Who the heck are you to try and tell me what to do? So the fact of the matter was he was bigger and stronger than I was. <laughs> so I had a hard time. <laughs> But in my eyes, he was a servant. <laughs> but he was lording it over me, so I was the servant. So these things are all very interesting, Martin. <laughs> Even so, when we were children, we were in bondage under the elements of the world. But when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his Son, made of a woman, made under the law. Well, Martin, there goes the dogma of the Immaculate Conception. Yeah. Unfortunately, it belongs in the waste paper basket, according to this verse, because this woman was under the curse of the law. Mm. So she was not immaculate without sin. Yeah. And how could she be? Because she needed redemption. Exactly. And that could only come through the blood of Christ. So, Martin, there's so much depth in all of this. To redeem them that were under the law, in other words, under the curse of the law, mm -hmm. that we might receive the adoption of sons. Yeah, so becoming heirs. So we become heirs. And because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. 
So if I do not have the Son and I do not have the Spirit of the Son that has kept every precept and is my righteousness, then I am lost. The same applies to Mary. She was born under the law. The only way she could be saved is through the blood of the Lamb. Therefore thou art no more a servant, but a son. And if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. It's a, it's a beautiful doctrine oh, for sure. of salvation. He continues, Howbeit then, when ye knew not God, ye did service unto them which by nature are no gods. But now, after that you have known God, or rather are known of God, it's very well put, yeah. how turn ye again to the weak and beggarly elements, whereunto you desire again to be in bondage. Martin, if you have tasted salvation, if you have tasted that the Lord is good, if you have tasted the redemptive power that has taken you out of this world of sin and debauchery and brought you to an understanding of things that are holy and pure and just and good. Why do we want to return to the beggarly elements yeah. to which we were in bondage? Do you want to go back to the rave scene? No, not at all. Do you have any desire to go back? Does it draw you? No, it's like a, a dog returning to its vomit. Okay, well put, Martin. That's biblical, by the way. Yeah. You observe days. Do we need to say more? <laughs> <laughs> and months and uh. times and years. How many festivals have we had lately which were the observance of days and months and times and years? And for a short while they were, even while they are keeping days and times and years, mm. There is a longing for something better, but then when that day is over, back to the grindstone and back to the old life. Nothing changes. Yeah. I'm afraid for you, lest I have bestowed upon you labor in vain. Brethren, I beseech you, be as I am, for I am as ye are, ye have not injured me at all. You know how through infirmity of the flesh I preached the gospel unto you at first, and my temptation, which was in my flesh, ye despised not, nor rejected, but received me as an angel of God, even as Christ Jesus. So he had a thorn in his flesh. Mm. And it was there as a reminder to keep him humble. Yeah. Martin, I've got news for you. <laughs> I've got a few thorns. <laughs> Where is then the blessedness you spake of? For I bear you record that if it had been possible, you would have plucked out your own eyes and have given them to me. So I assume there was something seriously wrong with his eyes. Well, after even being blinded by Jesus, I think he kept the reminder there. Yes, it wasn't the same. And he also said that he wrote with such large letters, you know, uh, I can identify with him. <laughs> Am I therefore become your enemy because I tell you the truth? They zealously affect you, but not well. Yea, they would exclude you that you might affect them. But it is good to be zealously affected, always in a good thing, and not only when I am present with you, my little children of whom I travail in birth again until Christ be formed in you. Christ in you, the hope of glory. So Martin, all of these traditions and all of these things that the world is steeped in will not save you. No. You must have this relationship. You yes. must go through the process of repentance, acceptance, and you must and humble yourself. You must break yeah. on the rock. What must break? What must break on the rock? All of you, the old man, all this. Your pride yeah. must break on the rock. Mm -hmm. Your jealousy must break on your rock. The hatred that you have for whatever out there in the world must break on the rock. All of these things must break on the anything rock. selfish, anything that you cling to, anything that you think you cannot overcome. That must, must break, break on, on the, the rock. rock. It must break. It must shatter. It may never be resurrected again. I desire to be present with you now and to change my voice, for I stand in doubt of you. Tell me, ye that desire to be under the law. In other words, under the 
bondage of the law. Yeah, you that are trying to keep the law to be saved. Yes, well put. Do you not hear the law? Now is and is in bondage with her children? For it is written that Abraham had two sons. This is a beautiful allegory. Mm. The one by a bondsmaid and the other by a free woman. But he who was of the bondswoman was born after the flesh. It wasn't by faith. It was through his own works. works. But he of the free woman was by promise. Mm. Which things are an allegory, for these are the two covenants, the one from Mount Sinai, which gendereth to bondage, salvation by the law, yeah. which is agar. So through my works I will save myself. Yeah, it actually started with Cain. Yes. For this agar is Mount Sinai in Arabia and answers to Jerusalem, which now is and is in bondage with her children. But Jerusalem, which is above, is free, which is the mother of all. Now people will take that and say, see, the law is gone. Gone, yeah. <sighs> oh. Salvation by your works it's will gone. not save you. Yeah. Yeah. For it is written, rejoice thou barren that bearest not, break forth and cry thou that travailest not. For the desolate has many more children than she which has a husband. So this one that is broken on the rock and receives by faith has more children mm. converted to the gospel through their testimony. That's it. Now we, brethren, as Isaac was, are the children of promise. But as then he that was born after the flesh persecuted him that was born after the spirit, even so it is now." Nothing has changed since the time of Cain and Abel. No. Nothing. Up until today, it's the same. The one born of the Spirit are persecuted by the other. Yes. Nevertheless, what says the Scriptures? Cast out the bondswoman and her son. For the son of the bondswoman shall not be heir with the son of the free woman. So then, brethren, we are not children of the bondswoman, but of the free now, some take this literally and make it a racial issue. Isn't it sad, Martin, that it's they don't get it? What's an allegory? Yeah, yeah. Is it literal? No. It's supposed to show you in every situation how it can pertain. So, Martin, we have to sail this boat through all of these quagmires. So, what is the point of all of this discussion? The point of the discussion is simply this. You have to put law and grace, justice and mercy in the right relationship. You cannot negate justice at any time. No. I'm busy working on a sermon at the moment. And if I can preempt a little bit, I, I say in the sermon that in the world there is a huge cry for justice. Yeah. Isn't there? There is. On every level, there is a cry for justice, but there is no justice. Mm -hmm. If you take the war in Gaza, mm. on either side of the divide, there is a huge cry for justice. Exactly. If you take the issue of the abuse of children and pedophilia, there is a huge cry for justice. If you take the injustices that are happening in the world, even in the courts of law, mm. there is a huge cry for real justice. And some people are condemned to prisons for 40, 50 years when they were innocent. Yeah. And they think that a little bit of money in the pocket will be retribution for such a mistake. Thank God God doesn't make a mistake, right? Thank God. And then I thought, thought about myself, and I think, you know, everybody in the world has the sense of justice. Mm. Does that include the atheist? Yeah. Even he wants justice. He wants justice. But will he ever get it? Not in the way that he wants it. No, there will never be justice no. for the atheist, no. because there will be no final justice. According to him, there's nothing hereafter. Mm. 
So he has a cry for justice, but no means of obtaining it, which is pretty ridiculous. So how do you want to live a life campaigning for justice when your very ideology negates justice? You will never, ever receive it. So there must be a final gathering of people that put law and grace in the right perspective. Mm -hmm. Justice and mercy. So if we can come to come some conclusion in this matter, would you agree, Martin, that the final gathering commences after the end of the longest prophecy in the Bible? Yes. The 2,300-day prophecy, mm -hmm. after which there would be time no more. Yeah. Now, that doesn't mean that the world has come to an end, but prophetic time has come to an end. Now, that prophecy ends in 1844. Yeah. So after 1844, there would be no more prophetic time, only prophetic events. Mm. So the final movement to come out of the church in the wilderness would be those that keep the commandments of God and hold to the testimony of Jesus. Is that biblical? Revelation 12 and 14. They would preach the three angels' messages and herald the universal final loud cry. So there's no other movement to come after this as the loud cry culminates in the second coming of Christ. Would you agree with that? That's it. It's a final movement since there's 1844. nothing else, eh? No. No, can't be. Okay. So if we quote Acts of the Apostle, page 163, God has made his church on earth a channel of light and through it, he communicates his purposes and his will. He does not give to one of his servants an experience independent of and contrary to the experience of the church itself. Even Paul uh -huh. was given the instruction to go to a certain place and he would be told what to do by, by the church. Yes. Jesus, after appearing to him personally, sent him back to the church. Yes. Neither does he give one man a knowledge of his will for the entire church while the church, Christ's body, is left in darkness. So if he gives light to someone, let's say a prophet, that light has to be disseminated to the church. Mm -hmm. And the prophets were for the church. In his providence, he places his servants in close connection with his church in order that they may have less confidence in themselves and greater confidence in others whom he's leading out to advance his work. So God has a church. That's it. He has a quote from Testimonies to the church. That which Brother D calls light is apparently harmless. It does not look as though anyone could be injured by it, but brethren, it is Satan's device, his entering wedge. This has been tried again and again. One accepts some new and original idea which does not seem to conflict with the truth. He talks of it and dwells upon it until it seems to him to be clothed with beauty and importance for Satan's power to give this false appearance. At last it becomes the all-absorbing theme, the one great point around which everything centers and the truth is uprooted from the heart. So, Martin, is it possible that within the church, yeah. Brother A and B or C or D can start harboring or can start harping on one particular aspect mm -hmm. which is not wrong necessarily in itself but detracts from the message that has to be given to the world in oh, the time we live in. For sure. And it's, we see that happening all the time. If you look at the example of Daniel 11 and Daniel 12, the king of the north and south. It's not a salvation issue. But it, when dwelling and letting it absorb all your time, it can become an, a problematic thing. All right. So any other doctrine, whatever it is, one particular thing that fascinates you, anything that detracts from the mission, which is the three angels' messages at the moment, uh, can happen in the church. Do I then leave the church because of it? No. No. You try, like Paul, to correct the situation. And if they don't want to listen, well, then eventually God will make another plan. Yeah. 
So in other words, Martin, when men arise claiming to have a message from God, but instead of warring against principalities and powers and the rulers of darkness of this world, they form a hollow square and turn their weapons of warfare against the church militant. Be afraid of them. Now, does this mean that you may not correct wrongs within the church? No, that's exactly not what it means. Tell the house of Jacob their sins. That's it. So you you're may not, do that. You're not turning your weapons against the church if you point out these apostasies. No. When you're standing outside, screaming that the church is apostate, then you have a problem. And the church actually might be apostate. No. But the fact that you've removed yourself from the church means that you have separated from the body. They do not bear the divine credentials. God has not given them any such burden of labor. They would tear down that which God would restore by the Laodicean message. This is very interesting, Martin. So the Laodicean message is stop being lukewarm. So can we just make it clear because we've had m how many accusations that you said that stay we should church. stay in the church and we should stay in the Laodicean Laudis state. Uh, the rebuke to the church is to come out of the Laodicean state. Yeah. So in other words, Martin, the Lord lays upon no man a message that will discourage and dishearten the church. He reproves, he rebukes, he chastens but it is only that he may restore and approve at last. So, Martin, we have to wait for God to bring about a shaking. So the Lord lays upon us the message to encourage people to show out these things, but like you mentioned, it's he that will do the restoring and all of this. Otherwise, I judge things before the time, okay. right? How glad my heart was made by the report from the General Conference that many hearts were softened and subdued, that many made humble confessions and cleared away from the door of the heart the rubbish that was keeping the Savior out. How glad I was to know that many welcomed Jesus as an abiding guest. Martin, who am I to judge whether that will happen in some individuals or whether it won't? Leave that to God. How is it that these pamphlets denouncing the Seventh-day Adventist church as Babylon were scattered abroad everywhere at the very time when that church was receiving the outpouring of the Spirit of God? How is it that men can be so deceived as to imagine that the loud cry consists in calling the people of God out from the fellowship of a church that is enjoying a season of refreshing? Oh, may these deceived souls come into the current and receive the blessings and be endued with power from on high. This must be very painful to many people. Yeah. Now, I'm not saying that this church is currently receiving the blessing. And I've been very firm in saying, you can pray until your knees are raw. If you don't change your course, you are praying in vain. That's if you don't remove yourself from the lauded sea and state, if you don't buy gold refined in the fire, which is the righteousness of Christ, which is made manifest by obedience to all that he commands, mm -hmm. which includes not only the Ten Commandments, but all the other issues, including health reform besides, then, once you have cleaned that house up, and you go on your knees and pray for the outpouring of the mm. Holy Spirit, which will be given to them that obey him, yeah. then you can expect it to happen, even within the church. Even within it. And if you don't adhere or do all of those things, then God will do the shaking. Yeah. Again I say, the Lord had not spoken by any messenger, who calls the church that keeps the commandments of God Babylon. True, there are tares with the wheat, but Christ said he would send his angel to first gather the tares and bind them in bundles to burn them, but gather the wheat into the garner. I know that the Lord loves his church. It is not to be disorganized or broken up into independent atoms. There is not the least consistency in this. 
there's not the least evidence that such a thing will be. Those who will heed this false message and try to leave in others will be deceived and prepared to receive advanced delusions, and they will come to naught. There is in some of the members of the church pride, mm -hmm. self-sufficiency, stubborn unbelief, and a refusing to re yield their ideas, although evidence may be piled upon evidence which makes the message to the Laodicean church applicable. But that will not blot out the church, that it will not exist. Let both tares and wheat grow together until the harvest. Then it is the angels that do the work of separation. Martin, I cannot because I see apostasy run. Because there's nothing after this. Even Paul, the apostasy, who made did the apostasy after the Jerusalem Council. The leadership. Yes. Did Paul leave the church because of that? No, he did not. So the church is the light of the world, although there are evils existing in the church and will be until the end of the world. The church in these last days is to be the light of the world that is polluted and demoralized by sin. The church enfeebled and defective needed to be reproved warned and counseled, is the only object upon earth upon which Christ bestows his supreme regard. Wow, Martin, that is an amazing yeah. statement. It's a powerful and strong. Yes. The world is a workshop in which, through the cooperation of human and divine agencies, Jesus is making experiments by his grace and divine mercy upon human hearts. Angels are amazed as they behold the transformation of character brought about in those who yield themselves to God. And they express their joy in songs of rapturous praise to God and to the Lamb. They see those who are by nature the children of wrath converted and becoming laborers together with Christ in drawing souls to God. Do we have those also in the church? Yep. Do we have the apostates in the church? Yes. They see those who were in darkness becoming lights to shine amidst the moral night of this wicked and perverse generation. They see them becoming prepared by a Christ-like experience to suffer with their Lord and afterwards to be partakers with him in glory in heaven above. So where is most of the juggling taking place? Outside or inside? Inside, inside, definitely. Is it a painful experience? For sure. But maybe we can give some advice. If instead of getting pulled into all this conflict in the church, if you focus on bringing the three angels' messages to the people outside, then this won't take up so much of your time. No, you won't have time for it. And then when you bring the people in, you warn them that this is not the perfect place. You tell them. Yes. And once you've given the warning... That's it. You don't have to give it over and over, over and over. over and over again. And you don't have to play policeman to see that everybody no. does it. If they don't want to do it, that's their business. And you carry on with the commission. Carry on with the commission. So the third angel of Revelation 14 is represented as flying swiftly through the midst of heaven, crying, Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Here is shown the nature of the work of the people of God. They have a message of so great importance that they are represented as flying in the presentation of it to the world. They are holding in their hands the bread of life for a famishing world. The love of Christ constraineth them. This is the last message. There is no more to follow, no more invitation of mercy to be given after this message shall have done its work. What a trust, what a responsibility is resting upon all to carry the words of gracious invitation. And the Spirit and the Bride say, Come, and let him that heareth say, Come, and let him that is athirst come, and whoever will, let him that take the water of life freely. Now, here's a very important point. Mm -hmm. Christ does nothing apart from his church. Huh? It says over there, The Spirit and the Bride yes. say, Come. 
But many people say, I don't want the bride. I yeah. only want the spirit. Mm. You can't have the one without the yeah. other. So the Lord has declared that the history of the past shall be rehearsed as we enter upon the closing work. Every truth that he has given for these last days is to be proclaimed to the world. Every pillar that he has established is to be strengthened, not torn down, Martin. <laughs> we cannot now step off the foundation that God has established. We cannot now enter into any new organization, for this would mean apostasy from the truth. I hope that the spirit of prophecy is clear. I, sometimes it's so clear that people don't want to adhere, so they try to get rid of it. All right. So if the truth has once been established, no matter how you tear at that foundation, it has been established. It is there. So when the power of God testifies as to what is truth, that truth is to stand forever as the truth. Mm -hmm. No after suppositions contrary to the light that God has given are to be entertained. Does that mean they won't be entertained? No. Unfortunately, they will. Yeah, as long as there is a devil, they will be entertained. That's it. Men will arise with interpretations of Scripture which are to them truth, but which are not truth. The truth for this time, God has given us as a foundation for our faith. He himself has taught us what is truth. Mm. One will arise and still another with new light which contradicts the light that God has given under the demonstration of the Holy Spirit. We have leaders that say what we believe is 19th century mm. delusion. That's why I say they want to get rid of the spirit of prophecy because it doesn't fit in with what they want to believe. I don't care what they say. <laughs> Do you care what they no. say? No, because truth will stay truth. Yes, and some of them have done this publicly and some of them I've even answered publicly. And they will not get me to move and I probably won't get them to move, but that's not the issue. Do I now leave the church because these people were church leaders? No. No, I pity them. <laughs> that's it, pray for them. A few are still alive who pass through the experience gained in the establishment of those truths. God has graciously spared their lives to repeat and repeat till the close of their lives the experience through which they passed, even as did John the Apostle till the very close of his life. And the standard bearers who have fallen in death are to speak through the reprinting of their writings. I am instructed that thus their voices are to be heard. They are to bear the testimony as to what constitutes the truth for this time. Now, let me just make another point here, Martin. Mm. Because these standard bearers were involved in the proclamation of these truths, does that mean they understood all the truths? No. Or must we still filter what they said through the scriptures and the testimony? Of course. Okay. So whatever has been said in the past is not necessarily gospel unless it is in harmony with the Bible and the Spirit of Prophecy. And it was most of the times, actually but probably all of the time, acknowledged through the Spirit of Prophecy. Correct. Or they changed their opinions. That can so if you read an early opinion, maybe you should compare it with a later opinion. That's always very important. Always. And the church is made up of saints. Yeah. And then sometimes even people that had the truth strayed from it later on. Correct. And even if there are saints within this church, mm. the Bible says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Oh. All of us are in need of divine grace. All of us need to buy gold refined in the fire. Nobody, but nobody is exempt from that. So let us rather remain humble and acknowledge that we are as much in need of the grace of God as those who are blatantly apostate. And let us pray for each other and let's stick together and let me reiterate, by superglue, stick with it and wait till God cleans up the ship 
And then when the loud cry comes, we will know who was on the Lord's side. But in the meanwhile, don't sit and do nothing. Give the message. Go and preach the three elders. Give message. the message. Preach the message. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, this subject has to be agitated over and over and over again. And I, I understand, Lord, that this war will wage until the last day. But please, Lord, enlighten minds. And like Paul, send them to those that are the representatives of your truth for the times we are living in. is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.